Hello, my name's David Kemworthy. This is the second presentation about the work of Professor Alexander Tom. And what I'm going to show you today is a proof using the work of Harrison Stockdale, a proof of the megalithic yard, and also an explanation as to why there are 56 post holes around the first phase of Stonehenge, the Aubrey Circle. We think the uh, first phase of Stonehenge was built around 3600 BC. But I, I feel that these dates are, are very debatable. Um, I feel that, that a lot of these sites are possibly even older. Not significantly, but um, you know we might be going back to uh, what we find at Karnak, where Howard Crowhurst has done a lot of work. And uh, also we can look at um, Sumerian culture and Babylonian culture, where the Australian professors Norman Wildberger and Daniel Mansfield have produced an absolutely staggeringly brilliant paper about um, Plimpton 322, a Babylonian clay tablet. Uh, we won't be going into that today, but if you look down here... One of the proofs is Mansfield Wild Burger 322. That's a proof of the megalithic yard using their work. There's another one using the work of Crowhurst. Uh, there's some megalithic yard proofs on this tab, but we're looking at Harrison Stocktail today. And um, it's going to be a bit tricky for me, this, because I've got a time limit, as you know. So we're looking at this, Astronomy and Measurement in Megalithic Architecture. And as soon as I got this book, I just felt like I was holding something very special. There's a lot of work gone into this. We look in the yellow there, John Barnett. He used to be the, uh, the Peak Park archaeologist for very many years. And before he became the Peak Park archaeologist, he wrote a brilliant book about the archaeology of the peak. And he uh, was an advocate of the work of Professor Tom. So that's that. Now, if we look here, this has been published by Northern Earth Books, and they're at Hebden Bridge, and they produce a monthly magazine that I want you to be aware of, so I'll just show it you. This is um, blatant publicity. And, and I'm very proud to be able to do it. Issue 162, December 2020. It's a monthly magazine. And it, it, if you're interested in anything about megalithic culture or lots of other things in the UK and the landscape, this is the magazine to get. It's so entertaining and I, I, I recommend it 100%. And um, it's... It's just worth every penny and you can get a, an annual subscription and it makes the magazines much cheaper than the price that you can see on there. And um, I'm sure they'd be grateful of, of uh, any new uh, members that they can get for our subscribers for the magazine. So please subscribe to this magazine if you're interested. It's just a, a, a brilliant magazine. Thank you. So that's that. Now, John Barnett. This is his book, another book, um, Stone Circles of the Peak. I don't know if you can see that, Stone Circles of the Peak. Now this is what he says about Tom. The over-technical approach of Tom is limiting. Well, I agree with that. Though understandable, he is a product of his age. His arguments have not been helped by a number of people who've taken up his theories as a starting point for flights of fancy of their own, some of which are obviously untrue. For example, the claims that they are built by the Egyptians or even by extraterrestrial beings. And then he mentions Michel, who's very, very important in the field of uh, ancient metrology, historical metrology. And then he says, there is also ley line research which seeks significance in the alignment of ancient sites. Although the traditional world of archaeology has dismissed these as pure supposition. 
However, some of these more subjective approaches are surviving the test of scientific investigation. Now, if we look at my first presentation, this is exactly what I've done. I've drawn a massive ley line across the UK and using Google Earth, it goes through sites that are of tremendous historical archaeological interest and they're all megalithic. And there is one thing that stands out to me above everything else, and it's the dating of Old Sarum as an Iron Age hill fort, 500 BCE, because it is not, and it cannot be, and it cannot have been built by Iron Age tribes. The people that, that built Old Sarum, which is a massive civil engineering project, must have been the people that built Avebury, must have been the people that built the Stonehenge complex. They could not have been Iron Age tribes because those people just didn't have the capacity to do that kind of work. And the Iron Age hill forts in the UK, I believe, are all wrongly classified. These forts are actually megalithic enclosures and um, a lot of them are astronomical observatories. So that said, where are we up to now? I don't know why this has come up. I knew this would be difficult. Megyard proofs. Chart one. I've managed to draw a chart there without knowing about it. Right, this is where we are. Proving the Harrison Stocktail megalithic foot using page 47, Tom Book 1, and Michael J. Farrar, the Tom family quanta, of 4.71 imperial feet. Right, the first point I want to make here is this. Michael J. Farrar. Hopefully I'll be able to get this up. There it is. Um, I've done a search. Michael Farrar, Alexander Tom, 4.714. Um, this is what Farrar says. Doc MS3, what came before the English statute system of... Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> Now, Norman Weilberger can tell you a few things about dot, dot, dot. Michael Farrar, what came before, blah. The data presented by the Tom family included a quantum of 4.714 feet. Megalithic man appears to have dot, dot, dot. I think megalithic man knew a lot about dot, dot, dot. So anyway, let's go back. and see what 4.714 is. And we can see the complexity of what they were doing here. It's absolutely brilliant. There's 4.714, and I'm, I'm using uh, Microsoft Excel here. It says up, up there at the top. The file's called Tom Proofs. So, what have I done? Nothing. Right, we're going to go to this cell. And it's 4.714 divided by 1.1785. And I'm, I'm wondering now if, if Peter Harris watches this, he'll be surprised by this. Because the Tom family quanta of 4.71 imperial feet is what Michael J. Farrar is talking about. And this guy is high class. His work is really, really high class. So we go to here. We multiply him by 12. That by 12 is 14.142. So Michael J. Farrar and Harrison Stockdale, by using the work of Tom, have discovered exactly the same unit of measure. It's 14.142. And without any doubt at all, this is 10 root 2. And the ancient designers of these megalithic sites approximated using universal constants, and in this case it's root 2. And ancient root 2 times 10 is 99 over 7 imperial inches. Now, this is what Michael J. Farrar is writing about. But what we find with um, Peter Harris, which just knocked me out when I first read his book, um, is the fact that I was, I was trying to figure out why there are 56 postals around the first phase of, of Stonehenge. And then I pick his book up. After Bill Wilkinson, by the way, who I talked about in the first presentation, 
after Bill Wilkinson had told me to get a copy of this because it was so fantastic. And, and look what he's saying. The megalithic foot was subdivided into 56 equal parts. Right. Um, and it's 0.2525 inches. Now that is an interesting unit on its own. Um, and it's all in... Um, it's all in decimal measure and what I've found is that decimal measure is really hopeless when we're trying to work out what these people were doing because they use fractional maths and when I was trying to work out how to calculate eclipses I got very lucky because someone on a website that I was on where I was trying to glean information about how I can, how I can go about learning how to calculate eclipses he said to me there's this site that, um, this NASA website that you can use. And, and he said, and by the way, all these calculations you keep boring everybody with. Um, the ancients didn't use decimals, so, so they're all totally irrelevant. And now, to me, that was really useful because I didn't really want to be using decimal because it kept producing these massive strings these infinite strings of numbers that, that were just so irritating, you couldn't pin anything down. And when I realised that, that they were actually using fractions, everything became very clear. So let's have a look at what the first phase of Stonehenge does. Now, there's a unit of measure here, 897.6. I made it big there because it's a big unit, this. Uh, we look at Tom's first book. I hope I'm not going to create any more graphs here. Um, what's it saying? 105 megalithic yards. The Aubrey holds. The, the diameter is 105 megalithic yards. And he's got 329.87 there as the circumference. But he's saying they weren't using real pi. They were using 22 over 7, and that gives us 330. 330 megalithic yards. This is a beautiful unit of ancient measure. And what it is in imperial feet is 897.6. Now, what we find is when we use 10 root 2 and express it in feet and divide it into 897.6, we get 761.6 units which is 56 times 13.6. And what we're finding is the megalithic yard was designed to work with root 2 at the Aubrey Circle. There's no doubt about this. And when, when I first contacted Peter Harris about his work, he was of the opinion that he'd discovered something entirely independent from what Tom had discovered, this 10 root 2. And over time, I think he's come to realise that it, it actually, this relationship between 10 root 2 and the megalithic yard is deliberate. And we're going to look at it now, and this is going to be the end of the presentation. But this is Peter's book, and this is my, these are my workings. And what I've worked out is here, if you multiply 99 over 7... By 12, it gives 99 over 84, which is this 1.178571. Multiply it by 2.72, exactly the megalithic yard, you get this number here. 3.205714 ad infinitum. That just goes on and on. It's so irritating. Now, these can be expressed as fractions. Everything that you see here can be expressed as fractions. But when I first was doing this, I never realised. So it's all in, um, in decimal notation. But when you divide that into 897.6, you get 280. <laughs> Brilliant. I absolutely love it. So if we take 1.36, and Tom said that he felt that there was a unit used, half a megalithic yard, which was possibly um, 
as important as, as the megalithic yard. If we use 1.36 in there, we get a smaller unit, so that doubles, so it becomes 560. And there is the megalithic yard proof. I mean, Tom didn't know any of this. He didn't know about um, 99 over 7, but it's there. And that's the proof. And this book is about astronomy. And look at this. This lovely little diagram. He got it off uh, John North. This is what you see. See this cross here? That's Avebury in the centre. We're looking at sunrise here. East. The sun rises in the east. And those three lines we're seeing the... Uh, this is... This is midsummer sunrise. This is the most northerly sunrise. And this one down here is the most southerly sunrise. And in between is the, uh, is the uh, equinox. And this is the centre of Avebury, this cross. And this is the what I've called the Avebury Cursus. Now this is this is Tom's this is what Tom has become famous for now. He is the first archaeoastronomer. So the archaeology at, at Avebury is this line here, it's a cursus. And what a cursus is, is from a point on a circle which is a centre, the ancients were dropping markers to show when the summer solstice was and when the spring and autumn equinoxes were and when the winter, which is the least northerly sunrise. This is the most northerly sunrise. Now, when I started looking at Tom's stuff, I was ashamed that I didn't know this. I've been, I've been around for 60 odd years and I didn't know that the rising sun moved up and down the horizon like it does, like a pendulum. I had no idea. Um, so this this um, this work that Tom's done is, is making us so aware of, of the natural environment that we live in. And when you go for a walk and you're aware of all this and you can see the Avebury site and you're walking down the ridgeway, which is a sacred pathway, the Cursus is along the ridgeway. The ridgeway is to the east of Avebury. And it finishes at a site down here uh, called the Sanctuary. And I think the Sanctuary is lined up with the least northerly moonrise. And it's very, very complex. It's easy to understand it on this, but it's very complex when, when you start to work out the movements of the moon. It becomes, it becomes a puzzle that, that is just so enticing uh, to know that they were marking these, mar uh, putting these markers on the horizontal, uh, distant horizon.